Hello. Before we begin today's show, we want to thank you, first off, for listening to our voices every week or every episode. But we also want to talk to you about some changes. As you may have noticed already, we are now a show with ads. That is very exciting for us. But what does this mean for you? Well, nothing is really going to change, but this does mean that you will hear two to three ads on each episode of Occupolitics. If you would like to access ad-free episodes, we've got you. You can head on over to patreon.com slash Occupolitics, and for as little as $1 per month, that's almost free 99 people, or four quarters that you found in your couch, you know, it's a quarter of a frappuccino, you can access all of our ad-free content and previous patron-only audio files like Girl Who Lived segments and more bonus content that has never, ever been aired on the main feed. As I said earlier, you're listening to Occupolitics. What are we? We are a Harry Potter reread podcast focusing on politics in the wizarding world. As always, I am Adri, one of your hosts and a recovering English major. And I'm Helene, your co-host and producer. And today we're going to be talking about Chapter 12, Magic is Might of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. But before we get to it, Helene, how are you? Oh, you know, I'm keeping on, keep on, keeping on. Uh, the Queen died. Well, um, yeah, that happened. Yeah, uh, so that that's like the big thing that's happened, I feel like, recently. Uh, I feel like there's been a hurricane in Puerto Rico that also happened, Helene. I mean, I was going to let you talk about that because... <laughs> I'm the Anglo-Saxon leaning person, and, <laughs> and you know more about Puerto Rico than I could ever imagine. Like, well, hope to. Um, a hurricane once again devastated uh, my home island, yes. and even though this one was not like a Category 5 or anything like that, the infrastructure was so weakened by the last one that... You know, it's going to be tough to rebuild. Um, you're probably listen to, listening to this like two weeks after the hurricane has passed because we're kind of banking this episode early on. But um, yeah, that's it's a lot. So if you want to help Puerto Rico, um, look for organizations that have roots in the island so that you can donate or you know, boost their signal. Um, why do I say that? Because I am experienced in working with nonprofits. And while a lot of nonprofits aim to do good, a lot of them like to just get donations in from whenever they can and wherever they can. I'm looking at you, Red Cross. <laughs> and then the people affected by those things don't really see like, maybe 50% of what you donated or, you know, even less is what they see. So yeah, look at uh, resources on how to help people on the Island and stuff like that, instead of, you know, donating to like major nonprofits who are basically run like companies anyway. Yeah. And uh, if you want to help the queen, um, it's too late. She's dead. And the royal family doesn't need your money. So any money that you were thinking about putting towards that, you should just put towards Puerto Rico instead. Yeah. Um, to the queen, all I have are thoughts and prayers. And maybe not even that. <laughs> yeah. I, I have never once been interested in the royal family. So when that happened, I was like, oh, OK, so what else is going on? <laughs> See, that's for me, what, at the level of like, oh, a human being died, I, that, that is very sad, but also yeah, like that is not, sure. not much sadder than any other human being dying, right? Like, okay, I'm sure that a lot of people like in her family really loved her and are going to miss her, but also, okay, this happens every day. And that sounds really terrible, but it's 
I know the truth. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, we have, I do, I know that we personally have like a good amount of um, European, like British listeners. And uh, for any of you that are mourning, I, you know, we feel for you. And uh, it's obviously like a big change. She was a very steady, uh, reliable historical figure for many, 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 many years. Um, and uh, yeah, that I, I'm sorry for your loss. But go help the people in Puerto Rico because they're really, uh, they really and need not help. just Puerto Rico, like anywhere who's that's touched by obviously natural disaster. Let's all, you know, global warming is going to make these natural disasters happen yeah. more often. So that's true. Dead. alarming to me, um, right. but right, right. not surprising. Yeah, but uh, let's talk about Harry Potter. Why don't we? All right. Um, so, Helene. What happens in this chapter titled Magic is Might? Yes, in chapter 12 of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, Magic is Might, this is the one where after weeks of planning and reconnaissance, the trio finally decide it's time to execute their plan and try to break into the ministry to get the locket back from Umbridge. Uh, they also learn, like, earlier in the chapter that Snape has become the headmaster of Hogwarts, much to their dismay. Um... But back to the main part of the chapter, um, as after the first part of their plan seems to be pretty successful, uh, they learn that their excursion might be a little bit more difficult than they had originally anticipated. Hijinks ensue, and a uh, nice big to be continued at the end of the chapter to figure out how it all shakes out. Yeah, that was that was a great cliffhanger right there. I was like, oh wait, this doesn't happen in this chapter. I have to wait yeah. until next time. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, oh, this is going to be a really long chapter. And I was like, oh, no, never mind. They, they end yeah. it. <laughs> same, same. Like, I was like, oh, this is going to be like a super long thing where we have a lot to talk about it. And then I was like, oh, wait, it ends there. <laughs> we still have a lot to talk about, I'm sure. No, we do. We do. And, and in that vein, in that spirit, let's let's talk about the politic that we chose for this chapter. Helene, when you read chapter 12, Magic is Might. What what ran through your mind? Yes, uh, this one was actually pretty um, simple to me. This was like the first or second thing I thought of, and it thought it felt pre- fit fit pretty well. Words. Um, I decided to go with uh, infiltration for my politics. So infiltration is defined as the action of entering or gaining access to an organization or place surreptitiously, especially in order to acquire secret information or cause damage. Um, so we see infiltration happen um, on basically two big levels. Uh, well, three really big levels in this chapter. The first um, is Snape and the Death Eaters um, showing that they have successfully infiltrated Hogwarts um, because Snape has been named the new headmaster of Hogwarts and uh, the Caros have been hired on as professors. And so it kind of solidifies even further. Like It's kind of like in um, Order of the Phoenix when uh, Umbridge was hired kind of to take control of Hogwarts um, on behalf of the Ministry uh, this is um, very similar in the fact that, like, the Death Eaters have, like, kind of unknowingly, quote unquote, uh, taken control of Hogwarts on behalf of Voldemort. Um, so there's that, and then obviously the big one is uh, the Harry, Ron, and Hermione infiltrating the Ministry um, to get the locket, uh, and then um, the last one is kind of like an overarching kind of like secret one, uh, not secret, but kind of like behind the scenes one. And that's just the Death Eaters and Voldemort, like having infiltrated the ministry as a whole. Um, and we see the results of that specifically very, um, very obviously in this chapter, especially near the end um, with like Yaxley and like the Muggleborn Registration Commission and, and all of that. Well, and not just that basically a physical representation of their infiltration right exactly so it's just kind of like a chapter filled with like like sneaky um integration into societies and structures that they weren't in before to kind of 
push their own agendas. Well, and how, um, I mean, it, it's just, I, I don't want to say how astute, right? But like, because I don't want to like give them kudos, right? <laughs> but like, right, right, right. How astute of them to not only infiltrate the, the Ministry of Magic, but also infiltrate the largest educational structure that the wizarding world has that is not actually governed by the Ministry of Magic, right? So it has its own like body of like, people who are you know making the decisions and they also infiltrated that body so you you know you get into the point i was just gonna say it's it's like the beginnings of that that kind of like hitler youth-esque plan that they talked that they talked about that we talked about last week in the episode um about the holocaust with like Voldemort's overarching plan is to eventually take control of the entire wizarding world including Hogwarts um in order to start his like brainwashing at, of course. at like the it, youngest age. Yeah, you can't dominate a people if you don't dominate their education, right? So yeah. in the way that we see it now is like all these book bannings that are happening across the country you know especially in red states like the one i live in texas where it's like wait you don't want students to learn about racism or like gender equality or um sexual orientation or anything like that why like because you want to kind of churn out these people who are biased and and that way you can control the well, my, the quote unquote minorities that you see as threatening. Like it's all these. Yeah. Things. Well, it's they're, it's alienating them from a very young age. Like if you're if you're brought up in a school where it's not okay to talk about being gay, you're going to carry that with you and um, not only enact that on yourself. Like if you are gay, others. not but others. Yeah. Um, and and obviously treat them as other um, and treat them as you know bad. Uh, because it, you are kind of programmed to when you were in school. So, yeah. And it's like all this like patriarchal, like white supremacy bullshit, right? Of we have to preserve the power and the power, the people who are preserving the power just, you know, are, tend to be like straight white cis male people, right? So, yay for that. Um, so, <laughs> Pink Queen, that is. That, that really just fits. Now mine looks inadequate in comparison, but <laughs> mine um, is the politics of planning. Um, so planning, as we think about it, is a way that we try to be prepared to perform a task that is ahead of us. Um, so when I think about planning um, in my life, right, like I, I love to plan. It's It's one of the things, right, that I love to do because my anxiety requires it. Um, I realized we're not 100% ready at all, like any time. We just have to execute plans when they're good enough. Like, don't don't let the enemy of good be perfect kind of thing, right? Yeah. So if we wait until we feel completely ready, none of us would ever get to do things, ever. Like, books yeah. wouldn't be published, uh, children wouldn't be born, uh, houses wouldn't be bought, that kind of stuff. Yeah, uh, my, milestone things, right? Um, yeah. So we see that in the chapter, mainly with the trio planning to execute this uh, infiltration, as you t- you call it, of the Ministry of Magic to find Dolores Umbridge. And Hermione is just like meticulously planning all of these things. And Harry's like, I got it, but also we need to like execute pretty fast because like, we've got a crowd gathering out there <laughs> trying to figure out if we're here or not. Uh, and also there, we have other things to do than just do the ministry of magic thing. Um, and yeah. we also see it in a, like a lower level with creature, like planning all the meals and like doing like all the stuff around the house and how everything's gleaming and nice. Um, so that takes a lot of planning and execution as well. Um, Clearly, the infiltration of the Ministry of Magic and Hogwarts took a lot of planning, <laughs> right? Yes. Um, so I thought about that. And, like, Severus Snape becoming headmaster, of course, that was, like, a big, big plan. Like, oh, the man who murdered Dumbledore gets to 
take his place without like the teachers just walking yeah, it's, it's kind of like um it's kind of like the uh the giant tribe right like the person who killed the the gro- the what is it what was it called the the main giant guy um got to take over yeah so- it's like are we enacting those laws in in hogwarts now like whoever kills the headmaster gets to be yeah, the well, <laughs> gets to be the new headmaster oh wait um that means voldemort is now the headmaster of hogwarts no it mean well okay well it, it went from snape to nagini technically and and now harry or no neville neville is the headmaster <laughs> Neville's the headmaster of Hogwarts, according to these rules. These rules. I don't make the rules. <laughs> these are the rules. Amazing. Yeah. I like this. New headcanon. There you go. Just Neville with, like, in his, like, office, headmaster office, surrounded by all the plants, you know, plant daddy. Yeah. Uh, worldwide. <laughs> just, yep. just being a headmaster with all the plants. Love that all for the, him. All the green. <laughs> I like this. This is my new head cannon, and we're here for it. <laughs> um, so yeah, planning was uh, my politic. Yeah, I thought about that one as well. Um, the only reason I didn't go with it is because I think I did it more, like kind of recently. I don't think it was in this book. Well, it might have been in this book, but I don't know. I felt like I had done that pretty recently, but I also thought that it was very apt to this one, to this chapter. Do you have a quote to share with us for infiltration? Yeah, um, so the infiltration that uh, the quote technically um, that I chose surrounds is the um, infiltration of Hogwarts rather than the trio's infiltration of the ministry, but the quote is, the other teachers won't stand for this. McGonagall and Flitwick and Sprout all know the truth. They know how Dumbledore died. They won't accept Snape as the headmaster. And who are these caros? Death Eater, said Harry. They are pi- there are pictures of them inside. They were at the top of the tower when Snape killed Dumbledore, so it's all friends together. And, Harry went on bitterly, drawing up a chair, I can't see that the other teachers have got any choice but to stay. If the Ministry and Voldemort are behind Snape, it'll be a choice between staying and teaching, or a nice for you, few years of it in Azkaban. And that's if they're lucky. I reckon they'll stay to try and protect the students. Okay. Yeah, I mean, pretty self-explanatory. What about planning? <sighs> Well, <laughs> this one um, is the moment where Hermione just kind of learns a little bit of new information and she feels completely unprepared <laughs> for the task at hand. How do you know he works for magical maintenance, Hermione asked, her soup spoon suspended in midair. Dad said everyone from magical maintenance wears navy blue robes. But you never told us that! Hermione dropped her spoon and pulled toward the sheaf of notes and maps that she and Ron had been examining when Harry had entered the kitchen. There's nothing in here about navy blue robes. Nothing, she said, flipping feverishly through the pages. Well, does it really matter? Ron, it all matters. If we're going to get into the ministry and not give ourselves away when they're bound to be on the lookout for intruders, every little detail matters. We've been over and over this. I mean, what's the point of all these reconnaissance trips if you aren't even bothering to tell us? And then it goes off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, uh, like, you could just see her anxiety just spike <laughs> after that. Just, like, I just imagine, like, in my head, like, in that moment, she just wants to, like, throw all the sheaves of paper around the living room like right <laughs> this nothing. we know nothing we are not ready for this we are going to get killed <laughs> i just i i'm honestly surprised that that hadn't come up earlier in the discussion because like isn't like a huge part of knowing like who they're going to take the apologies potion for like knowing what their that person's job is like wouldn't they have talked about that because that's what Ron that's I think that's her point like like wouldn't they have talked about like oh what does this guy that Ron is planning to take over do at the Ministry of Magic and what did they just like oh we don't know like until now like how how did that not come up um, like maybe she said it and he wasn't paying attention and like the reconnaissance trips like he was just like 
Maybe. trying to like in his mind he was like <laughs> counting down like the lessons from how to get witches to like you or whatever that book was oh um, yeah <laughs> and, and then, like he's just like trying to put the moves on Hermione and Hermione's like we have a mission I'm gonna focus and she thinks he's on the mission but he's all here like how do I get her to like me you know <laughs> yeah that's possible it's very possible that Ron wouldn't be surprised I mean it's I don't think I don't think that's so out of character <laughs> True. Especially because she's like, we've gone over and over this. Like, right, yeah. every detail counts. Like, he's just like, oh, I thought you knew that. Because, like, he doesn't know what, like, he's so steeped into the wizarding world. And Harry and Hermione are outsiders that he yeah. doesn't understand, just like with the Tales of Beetle the Bard, what their gaps in knowledge are. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So I think it's both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's my head canon from now on. <laughs> I can I can see that. Sure. Yeah. So who is your character for infiltration? Uh even though he doesn't actually show up at all or is I don't even know if he's even really mentioned in this chapter. Um well, like straightforwardly, I decided to go with Voldemort because um like his he, basically he it's his plans of slowly infiltrating the wizarding world as a whole, as opposed to like outright like war and taking prisoners and murdering people and just like basically taking the ministry by force um, would be his other option. Um, like instead of doing that, um, he, and he's doing it like the slow building, infiltrating, like kind of under the radar type of way. And that is kind of um, what has led to the entire Wizarding World's mistrust for Harry and um, just, you know, all these obstacles that get in the way of the Order and the trio to kind of defeat him in a straightforward way. Um, I don't think that him doing it, trying to take the wizarding world by force would have honestly worked out much better for them. This was probably like a, the better way for the like most amount of people to stay alive. Um, but it was just uh, no. interesting, especially for someone who is like as conceited as Voldemort. I guess I just wouldn't normally expect someone like him to do it this way. You know, well, he's not interested in mass murdering witches and wizards, right? Like he wants control of wi witches and wizards. Like if he murders, yeah, but everyone, he also, but he would also want the the credit, though. When when you think? Oh, he yeah, but that's like later on. Like that's like phase ten of his plan. <laughs> you know, that's like when he like parades. Um, out in front of Hogwarts with like a dead Harry Potter you know what I mean like that's that's yeah. phase 10 we're yeah. still in baby steps here yeah yeah because he's an insecure person and he will not like step outside of the shadows until Harry Potter is dead yeah but yeah um just just seeing how his whole background of slowly kind of creeping into the winning world and taking over slowly like a like a virus or something um yeah a virus that is not not covid because that one took over pretty quick anyway yeah it's a, it's, um, it's a dormant virus that attacks all at once <laughs> exactly um yeah his his fingerprints or is it bone prints if he doesn't have hands um really I don't he know. Has hands. All over this. He has hands. I don't know. I just always see him like skeletally, like almost like, like in my mind's eye. I know this is not like movie canon or even book canon, but in my eyes, he's like a walking skeleton. You know what I mean? I can see that. Maybe like Skeletor. <laughs> I do. I mean, he might not have fingerprints for all we know, because like maybe his skin is like scaly, like a like a snake, and I don't think snakes or have. Or waxy, so. you know, like he's just like yeah. he has just like a coating, just like Ugh. waxy coating. Ew, gross. Anyway, that's <laughs> it. So, what about well, your character for planning? I'm. I have a feeling that I know what it is without even looking. To be honest, I mean, it's the planner extraordinaire herself. Yeah, it's her <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes sense. 
Also, just the outburst that I quoted is one of my favorite parts of this chapter. <laughs> yeah. Because um, you could just, I, could, I relate to that. Like, have you ever been in that moment where you're like, yeah, this is something that I did not account for. And now I'm starting to doubt whether I know the things that I thought I knew. Yeah. Yeah, totally. As any, I mean, I think anybody with anxiety probably can, can relate. <sighs> I just... I want all of them to go see a therapist. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? That'd be so That'd nice. That'd be great. <sighs> well, Helene, we've gotten to the point where we're going to talk about each other's politics. I'll start with yours. How do we see infiltration in the Harry Potter series? Well, I mean, Voldemort, in all books except for maybe book three, tries to... <laughs> infiltrate Hogwarts or the wizarding world to gain power. Yeah. Am I wrong in this? Yeah. Right. No, I mean, yeah, that's it. That's it. And like book three, which is like the biggest exception, it was Sirius Black trying to infiltrate Hogwarts to find his once friend, Peter Pettigrew. Yeah. And exact his revenge. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like I like I said, kind of like when I chose when I talked about the character I chose, like this has been going on slowly the entire series before the series even started. It's a like, slow burn. Yeah, yeah. It's been happening in the background for a long, long time, and it's had its moments of like high heat, right? But yeah. it's been simmering the entire time. Yeah, exactly. Um, or like when Ron and. Harry took the polyjuice potion in second year to like infiltrate the Slytherins to figure out the information that they needed to know about the heir of Slytherin. Ah, gorgeous. No notes. 10 out of 10. Well, I was thinking about that moment anyway from, for what I was going to say for yours. And I was like, actually, you know what? This also works uh, for infiltration. But I was thinking about like, cause planning throughout the series, I would say the first thing that comes to mind in general is just Hermione and all the books. Um, like if she, if Hermione wasn't there, like doing all this extra planning behind the scenes, like Ron and her, Ron and Harry wouldn't have like lived probably not past like, I don't know, the second book. Um, <laughs> I feel like they didn't do a ton of planning in the first book. Like, I feel like the first book, it was just kind of like, you know, oh, uh, let's just go into the chamber tonight. Or let's just go, let's go into the, the you know, what is it? Not the chamber. Trap but you know door, what I'm talking about. Trap door, right? The it trap door. Yeah. door. Yeah. Let's just, like, go find the stone, the stone tonight. Like, let's just do it. Like, it felt like a very last minute thing because they didn't know what they were really going to get themselves into. Yeah, but then once they were inside, the whole, like, wizard chess aspect of it required planning. Yeah. I guess, yeah, for Ron, like, the strategy of it. Um, but, yeah, I would say, like, the second book for is, like, the first real... <laughs> Sorry, the... Um, but from... You're right. From their perspective, no planning whatsoever. But from Dumbledore's side, plans upon plans upon plans. Yeah, Dumbledore in general is also a big planner. Um like he he just kind of has he just knows how what everything that's going to happen um and has like an idea of how everything's going to happen in his like like that he how he wants it to happen so uh that's also a good a good um example of planning throughout the series but like like in chamber of secrets if hermione hadn't done all that research about the basilisk and found a way to tell harry harry and ron like in the case that she got petrified like they would have died. There's no like th- that book would have like that would have been the end of the Harry Potter series. Like <laughs> so, um, Hermione and her MVP planning that came through really f- in clutch there. So, <laughs> <laughs> ah, how great! All right, let's move to something that is. Great and not so great. Not so great being the Dementors, uh, what we don't like in the chapter, and something great, chocolate, what we do actually like. Um, Helene, when you were reading this chapter, chapter 12, what was your Dementor, or as I lovely, lovingly call it, your Ted Cruz? <laughs> yeah, um, I, mine was the the sculpture, the Magic is Might sculpture in the, in the ministry where 
the ma- uh, mad the ma- yeah, the magic people the wizards and witches <laughs> are sitting on thrones made out of like muggles basically um yeah it was just like like th- i that made my like stomach turn like it made me sick um reading that part yeah it's that wizard supremacy right there yeah 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 just like the blatant like disregard for human life just in that like in the symbolic form alone but then the fact that like hundreds of wizards and witches every single day are walking past that and not doing a damn thing about it like and people who not necessarily are on like are like on the bad side like people who just normal wizards and witches who work at the ministry of magic who have nothing like to do with Voldemort or are not Death Eaters probably would never become Death Eaters. Like they just walk past it and like assume it and into their regularly scheduled lives, just like with no change. Well, mine was a throwaway line in this chapter um, that Ron says, and it's the following and when you think I used to fantasize about cutting off his head and sticking it to the wall on the wall, and that's regarding creature. Yeah, I couldn't tell if he was joking when he said that. Um, yeah, I couldn't tell either, but also just the line just gave me the ick, you know? Yeah. Uh, no, I. I mean, not not great. Um, I'm sure that, like, he probably said it for dramatic effect, but I also don't discount that he actually thought about that probably one time. Yeah, exactly. Um, Now on to uh, more beautiful things, uh, our chocolates. (laughs) Uh, Do you have a chocolate recommendation this week? I don't think so. Uh, Yeah, I don't think I've had anything super different. What about you? Yes, so Cadbury uh, milk chocolate bars are fantastic, especially now that I'm missing, you know, my favorite holiday candy, which is Easter candy, those Cadbury eggs. Oh, Cadbury eggs, the best. The best. MVP. I know, I know. I miss them so much. So sometimes for Halloween candy, they come out with Cadbury eggs, but I have not seen them at my local Walgreens or CVS. So I'm very disappointed. I barely ever see them outside of Easter in general, um, but I am looking forward to when they come back. Those were well, it, it, for for the Halloween ones. It depends on which market you're in, you know. So yeah. some some years I can find them in San Antonio. Is it like but... are they like Halloween themed? Like they have like like orange cream or something instead of so the egg yolk is green instead of yellow. That is literally the only difference. Oh, that's and... kind of cute. <laughs> I like that. That's cute. It probably like, doesn't taste any different, but no, it's like it's like ooh, we made them spooky, but not really. Yeah, because like um, because okay, for me, like I'm I'm a purist for Cadbury cream eggs because I really only like the normal cream because they make like chocolate cream and caramel cream as well, I like and I am like, wrong. why? Like, what that defeats the point. I just want the normal cream. The other stuff doesn't taste like a Cadbury egg. So, like, if they made a Halloween one, but it was like the like not the same cream flavor, oh, I would be like, no thanks. It's literally the the same thing repackaged so they can sell it twice a year, and I'm here for this kind of I mean, capitalism. Honestly, they should take a page out of Russell Stover's book and make a Cadbury cream egg for every single holiday, give themselves a reason to sell it year-round, I would buy it. Just yeah. turn, like, in, in like, um, hol- for Halloween, just turn the egg into a pumpkin, you know? Or, you know, they could stay with the, like, green yolk it's fine yeah yeah for but christmas like, it could be red and green i don't know yeah, but, I, don't yeah, it's, I think the, the thing is like it's an egg right so like eggs are not like they're, they're very like specific specifically seasonal to i don't care just put <laughs> put a santa hat on the cadbury bunny and say hey <laughs> The Cadbury Bunny also likes Christmas. Or Happy they could Christmas. Just use the same mold and make it into a snowball. Like, just say, it's a snowball! 
<laughs> like it's an oblong snowball. Yeah. <laughs> It's a, it's a really short, weird-looking snowman. <laughs> I would buy it. Oh my. oh, my God. Anyway, should we talk about the chocolate in the chapter now? <laughs> I was making, this is just, this whole conversation made me really, really crave some Cadbury eggs, and I do not have access to them, nor will I for many months, so I am sad. So we should move on, because I'm sad. <laughs> I am very sad right now. Anyway... <laughs> Colleen, what was your Cadbury egg in this <laughs> chapter? It was getting to see creatures just mental health, uh, like, b- get better. And just seeing him so drastically, like, much happier. Um, and just all the things, the wonderful things that come from that. Like, um, you know, it's, it's, it, she talks about... Um, how he showered basically well they, she doesn't say showered but like she says that his hair is clean and fluffy meaning that like he's his 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 mental state is in a his mental health is in a state where he feels like he can take care of himself again like that's a real yeah. thing with depression um people might there are some people who when they're depressed will stop showering will stop personal hygiene and so like just like showing that part of creatures mental health journey um and you know his food is tasting better which means either he cares more to cook or he like has more positive feelings towards the trio that he wants to make something that they will like um as opposed to like something that they will like pointedly not like because he hates them (laughs) Uh, (laughs) it could be one of those two things basically um yeah and just uh you know, he, he's happy. Like he's looking forward to making them like, I think it was like steak and kidney pie and have it wet ready for them when they got back from their like excursion or whatever. Um, which now that I think about it, yeah, they never yeah. come back to the house. They never and come back. Yeah. He's just probably just sitting there like, oh, I have all this steak and kidney pie. What am I going to do with it? Oh, poor guy. Um, oh. I didn't, I, I, like Ron, did not expect to feel, like, you know, <laughs> positively toward him, because he's been, like, a huge racist bigot the entire time we've known him, um, but I guess, it, I mean, like, this chapter kind of shows that you just, you show a little kindness to the, to someone, uh, and, you know, they might, they might surprise you. Well, your chocolate uh, was also my chocolate. I, the only thing I have to add to it is that Like, that transformation came from when he felt appreciated, right? Or felt seen. And that uh, just tugged at my heartstrings. Yeah, and I think part of it was also getting that that piece of Regulus back um, Mm -hmm. that he'd been missing. Because they talk about how, um, like, specifically his mood had increased a lot since getting the locket. That, yeah, and, that they, and that's what I mean by appreciated. I think that, yeah. that that to him was a token of I appreciate you, I see you, I see what's important to you, and I am trying to yeah. restore it to you. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought it was very it was a good message, you know. It's like if I showed up at your doorstep and was like, I brought you Daniel Radcliffe. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh yeah to, to see that like you care enough about me to like go out of your way to make something happen that you know is gonna only be special for me um also like put me in jail because if i kidnap him <laughs> it, de- it depends on how you uh, obtain daniel radcliffe for said plan <laughs> It could be of legal means. Because I cannot be in jail. I have a child now. I cannot spend one night in jail. Exactly. Uh, You just have to make sure that you come by Daniel Radcliffe by legal means. Exactly. Um, So (laughs) I feel like that's an apt comparison. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Um, If you ever do feel inclined to do that, I will be very appreciative. I will feel very appreciated. A, a, appreciated find, look once i find daniel radcliffe at the bottom of a stone basin i will for sure <laughs> give them to you amazing appreciate it thank you love it 
Those and fairy are not gonna stop me <laughs> from from delivering to you a full a full and uh, legally obtained <laughs> Daniel Radcliffe. Yes, just like I've always wanted. Just like you've always wanted. <laughs> just like mom used to make. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Uh, that being said, um, it's time for us to talk about the media we've been consuming, the stuff that has been uplifting us all. What have you been consuming, Helene? A couple of things. Um, uh, the one that I didn't write down, and I just want to say before I forget, uh, a new season of Great British Bake Off started. So I watched the first episode of that, and that was, it's just like such a delight. Um, that show always brings a smile to my face. Um, so I was happy to see that back, but I, there are two new, completely new to me things that I, um, started both of which I think you will be very interested in if you have not already partaken in, um, watching them. The first one is called the patient on Hulu. Mm -hmm. Um, it stars Steve Carell, um, and, uh, Domino Gleason. And Steve Carell is a therapist, and um, he gets kidnapped by his um, patient, who is played by Domino Gleason, who happens to be a serial killer. And the uh, the serial killer uh, really, really wants to stop being a serial killer, but he doesn't know how, and he didn't feel comfortable telling Steve Carell the like intimate details of his life um, and why he does what he does and like that he even does it um, in like the normal therapy setting. So he kidnaps him um, so that they can have like confidential sessions with him, like chained to the floor in, in the basement. Um, it's really, really, really interesting. Uh, I think Sounds mainly, so light -hearted. no, it's, it's actually like, not very dark which is surprising oh, okay. it's it's okay, not because... light it's it's like a, it's a psychological thriller i would say okay, um, okay i mean i can handle that i'm just like that seems like it's a hard balance to pull off like without getting too dark yeah it's it's very like obviously it's not it's not a comedy because like with steve carell you would expect it to be a comedy it's not a comedy um but it's so interesting because it's like, and I think this is why you'll like it because like it kind of really digs into why this man is like kills people. And like, like it's interesting because it's a complex thing of he, he really wants to stop. Like he does not want to kill people and he knows that therapy is going to help him get there. But the only way that he feels it's going to be effective is like, if he, is completely honest which if he was in a normal therapy session like the he the, the therapist would have to report him to the police because the therapist cannot guarantee that this person will not harm someone else or himself um, yeah yeah um they just like they like they would have to tell the police and like patient confidentiality like would just go out the window because they would pose harm potential harm to someone else or themselves um and so, like, this guy is, like, it's just interesting because he really wants to get better. And I feel I feel like I'd be really interested in it because at one point in my life, um, I seriously considered becoming a forensic psychologist. Same. Because yeah. those things really, truly just interest me, like, why people do the things they do, especially the horrible things they do. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, they're, it's really interesting, too, because they're, like, 20-minute episodes, which mm -hmm. is like just not what you would expect for something this intense. Yeah, I would expect and like I would just expect like fifty minute episodes for real. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's they're super short, twenty minutes. You they go by so like quickly, but they're so intense the entire twenty minutes, and um, it, the, they're still being released. I think episode five came out this week, and I think there's probably going to be like ten or twelve or something like that. So, um, okay. So definitely recommend that. Also, uh, Handmaid's Tale Season 5 started. If you're a fan, it's pretty intense and interesting so far. But um, last, the one that I actually want to talk about last is a movie on Netflix called Do Revenge. 
Um, oh, I've heard about this. I, this came highly recommended to me. I have not watched it yet. Yes, it is, I think, going to be like a Gen Z cult classic, honestly. Um, I got, uh, first thing I'll say, Sarah Michelle Geller is in this, which already shoots it to the top of my list. Uh, but it has an amazing cast. There's um, like uh, Maya, what's her name? Maya Hawk, I think oh, is. Yeah, yeah Maya Hawk. Um, yeah. from uh, Stranger, Things. Stranger Things and there's a, the girl from Riverdale I don't know her name but she's a main character she's in Riverdale there's she, the, um, she plays Monica in Riverdale yeah okay sure I think her name is like Camila Mendez or something I don't know if that's right or not no, um, that is not I don't think her name it's, it's, what's, her, uh, what's her name I have no idea I thought that was her name but I could be completely wrong um, I just know Riverdale girl um, and then um is it completely wrong? No, I'm just still typing. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> it is Camila Mendez. I'm oh so god. sorry. Oh my god, I got it right. Yay, okay. Um, <laughs> did you just like, do like Shawn Mendes and Camila Cabello together? And, and I like, mean, that is a, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, and that anyway, that makes sense. Um, yeah, and then it also has like the guy from uh, one of the main guys from Euphoria is in it. Um, so it's, it's just like a pretty great cast, yeah. Yeah, and there's the, one of the guys from Miss Marvels in it. Like, it's just the cast is like amazing. Um, and there's a big twist that I even didn't see coming, which is really, it's really hard to surprise me. You know what? I love this. I love, I mean, I, obviously, please don't spoil it for me because I love when a piece of media can surprise me still. Yeah. I am not surprised very often anymore. <sighs> Yeah, um, me either, which is why, like, that's a big bar for me. If if they surprised me, I like, even if everything else was bad, I can be like, well, the writing was good enough for them to to surprise me. So that is a big check in the plus column. Um, but this, like, the writing, everything else was great. Like, it was a great movie altogether. There was nothing bad about it, I would say. Um, but, yeah, uh, it's Sophie Turner is in it, and she plays. Uh, it's hilarious. It's, it's so funny. Um, I just watch it. Uh, I think it's gonna be like a big cult classic of this generation. So those are mine. Pretty great. Thank you. Those are really great recommendations. Um, I only have one recommendation, um, and it is a novel called the bodyguard just like the movie the <laughs> iconic movie but it is a novel that is not at all like the iconic <laughs> movie okay okay um, got it it is by Catherine center okay so here's the the premise i'm not okay. gonna spoil anything for you right okay or the it. listeners it is a rom-com because we know i love rom-coms but the bodyguard in question in this one is a woman and she is tasked with uh guarding a movie star hmm. there's a lot of uh you know stuff that goes in the background in both their lives i'm okay, not gonna okay. spoil that okay. and um even though there are some heavy topics it is a very lighthearted read it is exactly what i needed this week is it like a romance novel or is it like just a like a light romantic comedy it's it's a it's a rom-com um it doesn't have like explicit sex scenes it's very like family okay. friendly um in, in terms of like and i'm not you, interested you, just kidding <laughs> <laughs> right, like, if it doesn't have the sex i'm not here for it no um, sex, no it's it's one of those where it's like well if someone overheard me listening to it or you know read over my shoulder right, i wouldn't right. be like super embarrassed, embarrassed. Yeah. <laughs> Because I get so embarrassed so quickly. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. The only I don't get embarrassed about the Bridgerton ones, but but yeah, I can I can see that being a thing. I mean, it is what I I don't know. I'm an adult, but also like my mom is here. Like yeah, I don't. I don't want, yeah, I would. I don't think I would. I have yet to read a, a romance novel outside of the privacy of my own apartment. So yeah. I can see why. Like, I haven't tried yet. I'm sure it would be an experience. <laughs> an experience. So, um, if you have a trip planned or something where you have to, like, drive a ton, 
I do. I recommend The Bodyguard by Catherine okay. Center. I actually do have, I have a five hour drive there and five hour drive back to Wisconsin in a few weeks for a friend's wedding that I'm doing alone. So I, I have a couple of books already that I know I want to listen to. Um, but we'll see. We'll, we'll right see now, what I, I am listening to uh, book lovers by Emily Henry. One of my favorite authors, like she has not missed one single beat with me. Um, book wise, like this is the third book I read from her. I'm <laughs> highly enjoying it. I haven't finished it yet, but I am okay. enjoying it. Yeah. Um, the, the opening is perfect. No notes kind of thing. <laughs> like the premise right. is fantastic. But um, I'm still in early stages, so we'll see. We'll see next week what I have to say about that. Yeah, I assumed you would probably like that one. I've heard great things about it. Um, and other news that are not, uh, I guess, media that we've been consuming, I, I just wanted to, like, just note this because it wasn't in our intro banter that we usually do. Um, in, in mom news, um, Livy as I said last time, is teething, and that's fun for the whole family. But she also is doing the thing where she's trying to kiss everyone. Like, she, you know, Aww. we kiss her little cheeks. So now she's trying to kiss us, Aww. but it really looks like a, like an attack. <laughs> <laughs> because she doesn't know how to, like, do the kissy Aww. thing. She just, like, latches your, her, like, mouth onto your cheek. So like with both hands and it's the cutest thing ever and i had to say that i'm sorry is she like when she gets her teeth in what if she starts like biting your cheeks oh she'll probably start biting like when they bite they bite everything so it's fine it's fine i'm just gonna be like oh no we're gonna have to like train her like we train the dogs like, like the maybe dogs we'll bring, yeah. maybe we'll tra- maybe we'll bring out the water bottle <laughs> no, <don't spray laughs> your kid in the face. <laughs> Unlike the dogs, the kid can will eventually be able to speak English. So I feel like no should hopefully suffice. <laughs> oh my god! Oh no. But it's the cutest thing because she looks like she's attacking you, like kind of zombie-like, you know, like ah. <laughs> when she's trying oh. to kiss you. It's so cute. Oh, baby! It's not going to be as cute when she's big and she has teeth, but you know. Hopefully she won't be biting your face anymore at that point. God, I hope not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's let's hope that that's not the case anymore. <sighs> well, with that being said, <laughs> that's it for today's episode. Please join us next time as we talk about chapter 13 of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. This one is titled The Muggleborn Registration Commission. That one's also going to be a bundle of fun. We can't you yeah, tell? So, so much joy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but if you've enjoyed this conversation, uh, we'd love for you to take a second and just give us a five star rating here on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, wherever you happen to be listening to us right now. Uh, like we say every week, it definitely helps uh, new listeners find the podcast, and uh, it makes us really happy because we like to know that all the time and energy and effort that we're putting into this podcast every week is being heard and appreciated and if we're doing good work um, we'd love to know if there's something that you think we could be doing better Uh, you can also let us know be kind of respectful about it but you know we're here for for all types of feedback you can also email us at um you know archaeopolitics at gmail.com yeah if you have feedback don't put it in a review yeah um we're only accepting five star reviews at this time Uh, (laughs) actually um this is this is something i was i listened to this uh, podcast pod meets world about it's a the boy meets world podcast uh, by Danielle Fischel, Milford Allen, Ryder Strong. And I was listening to this week's episode, and at the end, um, they said something similar to this, where Danielle Fischel was asking for reviews, and she said, like, we're only accepting five-star reviews at the moment, but um, if you give us anything less than that, then the, then we have to start eating one another, and that's just not something that we want to do. Um, and I thought, and I was like, oh, my, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a way to get people to stop. I'm going to have to just, eat Adri alive if you give us less than a five-star view, and you do not want to make that happen. Wow, just the way to bring cannibalism into this. 
I mean, I did. I'm just repeating what Daniel Fischel said. Miss Topanga Lawrence herself said who's that. that actor, what, like, is this is cannibalism very in in Hollywood? Because like, who's that actor who got this? Army Hammer. Army Hammer. There's there's a documentary called House of Hammer about that that just came out that I actually tried to watch this weekend, um, but realized I couldn't because I don't have Discovery Plus. Um, I have Discovery Plus. <laughs> but, but no, the thing is, I tried to watch it on the Amazon behind the scenes. I use Adri's Amazon Prime account because she's beautiful and she lets me. Okay, so I have, Discovery Plus is a separate account. I have to give you the password. Oh, too. okay. Because yeah, yeah. because my Apple TV told me that I could watch the House of Hammer documentary on Amazon Prime Video, so I tried, and it was like, oh, the only way you can do that is if you subscribe to Discovery Plus through Amazon Prime. I was like, oh. So uh, you can have okay. So you you just download the um, Discovery Plus um, app, and then I'll you know for you. Okay. The, yeah. The, uh, the Adri Adri is my sugar mama. She gives me uh, <laughs> uh, what do you call it? Logins to different streaming services that I am too cheap to pay for myself. Um, <laughs> So I mean, that's I'm just I'm just spreading the wealth. I, honestly, <laughs> I'm already paying for it. This is not diluting anything on my end. You know, it's great. Um, I do not uh, contribute to that part of our relationship. So I'm I'm I am 100 percent mooching off of her. So there's it's that's totally fine. It's totally fine. <laughs> um, but before we end, I have some hot gossip about Army Hammer that might interest you and probably no one else. But did you know that he's working like selling timeshares right now? Like he is so when he's not he's eating so- humans. When he's not eating. When he's not fantasizing about eating humans. I hope it's just fantasies at this point. Um, you never know. Some yeah, weird so people are into ooh, shit. Maybe that's how he got his victims is through selling timeshares. Maybe. Who knows? Mm. I don't know if he has elevated to the level of being a full-on serial killer, because I feel like we would have heard about that. But maybe. (laughs) I mean, he comes from family money, too. It's it's a little murky, though. We'll know more. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Gail. I'm so sorry. This is all alleged. We don't want to get sued. Um... (laughs) My dog slash legal counsel was trying to give us a warning. <laughs> I mean, they made this whole documentary about it. So, like, if someone's going to get sued, it's probably going to be those people. Okay, but we haven't watched the documentary yet. We'll have more to talk about when we do watch the documentary. That's true. Okay, we'll watch it and we'll, we'll uh, what do you call it, report we'll, back. Re- oh, I was going to say, we'll report back. It's like, again, again, we share <laughs> logins and a brain. Yes. Well... <laughs> Until then, politics managed. (laughs) Support this show by going to patreon.com slash occupolitics. Our patrons keep this show going. You can find us online at occupolitics.com and we are at occupolitics on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can email us your thoughts at info at occupolitics.com. Leave us a voicemail at 915-996-1699 and you might just hear yourself on the podcast. Adriana Wilson is the founder and creative director of the podcast. Helene Karp is the producer and social media manager. Allison Pullman is the audio wizard and editor who makes us sound so good. Cover art and physical rewards are designed by Adriana Wilson. The views expressed by the hosts and guests are expressly their own and not representative of their employers or associates. Occupolitics is part of the MuggleNet family of podcasts.